kind of homesick for a country to which I've never been before. No sad goodbyes will there be spoken for time thought beautiful thought Jesus said I'm the resurrection and the life he that believes in me though he were dead yet shall he live and whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die he also said in my father's house are many mansions if it were not so he said I would have told you I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again, and I will receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you might be also. And then David's writings many years ago that is still pertinent, still important, and still precious. The Lord is my shepherd. I always think about the little girl that quoted that in Sunday school one day, and she said, the Lord is my shepherd. He's all I need. I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. 
Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Let us pray. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, eyes have not seen, ears have not heard the wonderful things which you have in store for your blessed children. And Father, we are so grateful that you have children. You don't have grandchildren like we do. Everyone is one of your children. Ruth was your child. She was one of your people. We pray that in this service of celebration of her life, and as we worship the one who gives us life, help us to be mindful, Father, it's all about you. And everything that we do and say should be for the glory of Jesus Christ. Let the words of our mouths, the meditations of our hearts, be acceptable in thy sight. O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. At this time, the niece has something to read for us. Yesterday, I sat in Aunt Ruth's living room in Doublehead, scratching the surface on 91 years of cards, letters, and photos. One thing that there were a lot of were thank you notes, dozens of blank notes waiting to be written on, boxes of thank you notes received from my family and friends, many in handwriting I recognized as my mother's, my siblings, or my own. Because you see, one thing Nanny and Aunt Ruth always insisted on was that we write thank you notes, timely, sincere thank you notes. If we were old enough to write, we were old enough to write thank you. So Aunt Ruth, this is your thank you note. I know you didn't like a lot of show, even though I also saw the tears in your eyes when we ignored your request and made a fuss anyway. And maybe you think we're making too big a fuss now and are inconveniencing ourselves with too much pomp and circumstance. But we're just doing what you always taught us to do. We're saying thank you. Because Saturday, as I was driving to Roanoke from Atlanta, the word that kept coming to me was gratitude. Aunt Ruth was generous to a fault, rarely spending money on herself, but quietly slipping a check into your hand as you headed off for college or cleaned away the dishes after a meal. When I moved into my own place in college and she heard I missed my piano, she gave me hers. When she would leave for home on the last day of school when she was still teaching, she'd stop by our house first and share all her end-of-year teacher gifts with us. I'm grateful for that generosity of material things and enabled me and others to do so many things. But the things I'm most grateful for are the priceless gifts that made me and my family who we are. The first of those gifts was the gift of reading. I've thought about Aunt Ruth so often this year. My little boy Jared will start first grade next week. And we've spent the last year working on phonics and sight words and reading together every night, including the copy of Green Eggs and Ham that Aunt Ruth gave me when I was a child. When I was in kindergarten, it was Aunt Ruth who taught me. She would get up early, do her chores at the farm, and what needed to be done for Uncle John Tom and my great granddaddy, and then drive to the valley and teach first graders all day. Then before she went home to take care of her evening responsibilities, she would find time to stop at our house and give me a reading lesson. We had lots of books in our home, most of them gifts from Aunt Ruth, and I'm still receiving magazine subscriptions she bought for me. Starting school knowing how to read gave me confidence and set the pace for my academic career. But even more importantly, learning to love reading opened me to the wonder of the world to the power of ideas, and to life lessons from Aesop and Little Women and even Dr. Seuss. I'm grateful for the respect Aunt Ruth gave me for the simple beauty of the land, 
for the visceral peace that you can only feel close to nature. You can't describe it exactly, but you can see it and you can feel it. The difference between a homegrown tomato and a store-bought. The difference between eating ice cream in front of the TV and letting orange sherbet melt on your tongue while you sit on the front porch watching a storm roll in over the cornfield at dusk. The difference between playing Barbie dolls on the cement floor of your neighbor's garage and playing with corn husk dolls under a muscadine arbor. I'm grateful for the values Aunt Ruth lived. They give us all a compass to direct our own decisions. There was her work ethic, balancing work and family and farm, commuting for almost 40 years every school day from Roanoke to the Valley. There was the simplicity of her lifestyle, where her only extravagances were books, and the rest was shared with others or saved for a rainy day. There was that disarming honesty. I remember one Thanksgiving we were all gathered together, and Sean and Kelly announced that they were expecting their first child. Aunt Ruth's first words were, well, I hope you have health insurance. <laughs> that honesty sometimes made us cringe, but we always knew where we stood, and deep down we knew it was said because she cared for us and wanted us to know no pain or disappointment. There was her practicality, where you found innovative ways to make do with what you had, like when she would use dental floss to tie our hair into pigtails when we visited in the summer. There was her feisty stubbornness. When she knew what was right and knew what she wanted, she would not be moved. And she had the confidence to know that anyone that mattered would still love her anyway, even if they disagreed. And finally, there was the sacrificial way she lived her life for others, for my great-grandparents as they aged, for the children she taught for 41 years, and for the rest of our family. That was one reason her marriage to Howard, when she was almost 70 years old, brought us such joy. On Saturday morning, when I got the news from my mother, I hung up the phone and I cried. The sound of their mommy crying pulled my children away from their cartoons to ask what was the matter. When I told them that Aunt Ruth had died, Jared put his arm around me and said, It's okay, Mommy. You still have us. <laughs> and that, indeed, is why it will be okay. Today, I mourn the passing of my beloved Aunt Ruth. And I mourn the world that will never be the same. Dirt roads are paved over. Kudzu is cleared to build big houses with small lawns and we buy our corn and tomatoes wrapped in plastic at the grocery store. But the truth is, we still have each other. And Aunt Ruth, and the home that meant so much to her in Doublehead, and the hard-working generation with the no-nonsense values that she and my grandmother were part of. All that we learned from them, all that they gave us, is a gift that cannot be taken away. It is a gift we can share with each other and with our children and our children's children. And when we do, Aunt Ruth lives forever. There is coming a day when no heartache shall come, no more clouds in the sky, no more tears to dim the eye. All is peace forevermore on that happy golden shore. What a day, glorious day that will be. What a day that will be when my Jesus I shall see. When I look upon his face, the one who saved me by his grace. And when he takes me by the hand and leads me through the promised land, what a day, glorious day 
that will be There'll be no sorrows there And no more burdens to bear No more sickness, no more pain No more parting over there And forever I will be With the one who died for me What a day, glorious day that will be What a day that will be When my Jesus I shall see When I look upon His face The one who saved me by His grace And when He takes me by the hand And leads me through the promised land What a day, a glorious day that will be Thank you. I've got room in my expedition. You could go back home with me. And uh, I'd, I'd steal you. Are you Baptist? Yes. Sir. I'd steal you from the Baptist if I could. <laughs> you did a beautiful job. I know how Ruth was. She didn't like a lot of fancy things and so forth, but she'd have to be proud. She would have to be proud. I was going to say, you know, they don't make families like they used to, but I'd like to think they still do. Because as long as you guys live, people like Ruth will live. And that's the important thing is the heritage that we pass on to our children, our grandchildren, our great-grandchildren. The nurturing and the loving and the caring. It's just something you can't buy with a price. It's a gift of God. And so we celebrate that gift of Ruth Birdsong Dunn today, who is survived by her sweet sister Anne and uh, also by nieces and nephews. And I was thinking as I started to get up here this morning, I don't know why any of you that know me wouldn't know why I love this area so much. Roanoke, Alabama, is a part of my roots. I grew up in Tallahassee, Alabama, which is not too far from here. I've been in Georgia since 1961. And people up there said, well, you ought to be a Georgia cracker by now. I said, it won't ever happen. (laughs) You can take the boy out of Alabama, but you can't take Alabama out of the boy. And if you really know me, you will know why I love Antioch so much for people like Ruth, the bird songs, and the Cayers, the Slagles, and just the Roystons. And we could go on and on and on and on. People that nurtured me. I came here in 1958. 24 years old and knew everything about everything that you wanted to ask. And to be truthfully and honest with you, I knew nothing. But I had a group of people here that nurtured me and loved me. And I have said in your presence, and I've said away from you, that every young minister ought to start in a church like Antioch on Doublehead Road in Roanoke, Alabama. So when I came here, Ruth was still teaching. Her mother and dad were still living the bird songs. I had the opportunity of knowing them and being in their home many, many times and even sitting at their table and enjoying those homegrown tomatoes and other kinds of foods that they grew. When I came back about eight years ago 
to be here for a short period of time, and we said temporary, till we could find somebody to take the church because I could not do what I felt needed to be done because of the distance. But temporary wound up being seven years. But you know, I have a love affair with people. And one of the things that I asked God when I became a Christian was that I would have love, unlimited love, for people. And people, he gave it to me. It was so easy to love somebody like Ruth. Now, when I came here, Highwood was still alive. I got to know Highwood. And I got to know Ruth a little bit better. And I found that Howard was one of those nonsense persons, and he was honest, and he said what he thought. If you didn't want to know, you shouldn't ask him, because he would tell you. But I never forget one day, we were talking, and he was talking about some of these ministers, you know, and he said, I have this lot of ministers I just don't care for. And I said, well, Howard, if it makes you feel any better, there's some I don't like. And Ruth said, Howard. And I said, you leave him alone. I said, he's telling the truth. And I respect that. And I think that was a thing that bonded them together so much as both of them could be very outspoken. And both of them were totally honest. And so there was a lot of the sameness in their lives. And the thing that I appreciate about Ruth is what you saw was what you got. You knew where you stood. And when I first came here, I, I'm a hugger and, and I, uh, I'm a very affectionate person and I don't hesitate to tell people I love them. And I mean it sincerely. I'm not going to tell you I love you if I don't. And it's easy to tell you because I do. And so when I first came back and I would go to hug Ruth and I could feel a little tightness, you know, to start with. And I think she thought, well, what kind of whippersnapper is this young man growing up to be? But the more I did it, uh, I, I didn't let it stop me because she said, don't you hug me. If she'd said that, I wouldn't have hugged her, but she didn't, never said that. And so I would hug her. And then it got to the point where I could feel the warmth and I could feel the response and I could feel the love. And I would say to her, Ruth, I love you. And to start with, I don't know that she said, I love you too. But before I left, and every time I would go to her house and I'd get ready to leave, I'd say, Ruth, I love you. And she says, I love you too. I don't know about you, but I love to hear that. My wife and I made a covenant when we got married 50 years ago that we would not let a day go by but what we let each other know. Now, you can people say, well, you, you know I love you because I, I support you and I do. That's fine to a point. But people still like to hear those magical, magical words. I love you. And so every day of our lives, we make sure that before we leave that house, we tell each other, I love you. Before we go to bed at night, I love you. And my children are the same way. And I told them, if you ever get where you think you're too big for me to hug you publicly, I'll knock your head off. But my children, thankfully right now, when we see each other, if we've seen each other two or three times a day, it's still a hug. And it's still, I love you. In talking with Ruth, I also found out that she was a spiritual person, but she wasn't the kind of person that flounted it. Uh, I'm a little bit skeptical of people who are always going around telling everybody what a fine person they are. It scares me. Because if you are living for God, you don't have to tell anybody. They'll see it. They'll feel it. Because our spirits will bear witness with each other. And so I began to realize that Ruth was very spiritual. She talked a lot about she was tired and she was ready to go home. I can't help but after I heard that she and Howard would, would have celebrated their anniversary August the 4th, that maybe 
in her mind's eye, she was looking forward to that date and just saying to God, well, how about that? That's a good time for me to come home that I can be with Howard and I can also be with my mother and daddy and I can be with a lot of people that I love. I feel that Ruth is at peace. I feel like she is with God. And I hope you do too because I feel like it's so important that we celebrate that part of her life, that part of her life that was a giving person, as you talked about. She loved her family. And every time I would go to see her and she'd say, Brother Floyd, I know you need to go see other people, and it won't make me mad if you don't come to see me as often as you do. And I'd say, hush up. I want to come to see you, so I come to see you. And she wasn't able to come to church my years here this last time. So I felt like it was my job to take the church to her. Ruth was a teacher by profession. You've already heard that. Teaching people, teaching children, teaching her family. I want to read this to you. Maybe you'll enjoy it. My daughter-in-law is a teacher. I am very high on teachers. They are the salt of the earth. And sometimes we don't respect them as we should. Listen, I've read this article. I've, I picked it out of the paper somewhere. It may have come out of Tallis Tribune. I'm not sure. And let me see if I've got this right. You want me to go into that room with all those kids and fill their ever-waking moment with a love for learning. Not only that, I'm to instill a sense of pride in, in their behavior and observe them for signs of abuse, drugs, and t-shirt messages. I'm to fight the war on drugs and sexually transmitted diseases. I'm to check their backpacks for guns and raise their self-esteem. I'm to teach them patriotism, good citizenship and sportsmanship, how to balance a checkbook and how to apply for a job. But I'm never to ask if they are in this country illegally. I'm to check their heads for lice. <laughs> you used to have to do a lot of that. I don't know if you have to do that anymore. Maintain a safe environment. Recognize signs of antisocial behavior. Offer advice. Write letters of recommendations. Encourage respect for the cultural diversity of others. And, oh, yes, I'm to teach. I'm required to be working summers and evenings at my own expense toward additional certificates and degrees to sponsor the cheerleaders. And after school, I'm to attend committees and faculty meetings and participate in staff development or training to maintain my employment status. I am to collect data and maintain records to support and document our school's progress in the selected state mandated programs. I am to be a paragon of virtue larger than life such that my very presence will all my students into being obedient and respectful of authority. I am to smile and carry on while being degenerated by rape parents, the media, and various political figures. I am to do all of this with just a piece of chalk, a computer maybe, a few books, a bulletin board, a five-minute plan time, and a big smile on a starting salary that qualifies my family for food stamps in many states. Ruth was a teacher. She will continue to teach because you will carry on that legacy. You are mandated today by God through life to carry on an example of that which you believe and that what you've been taught. I am blessed, truly blessed, that I knew Ruth Birdsong Dunn and Ann. And I had the privilege of visiting Ann many times because she was so faithful to stand by Ruth when Howard was so sick. And he loved you. He loved you. And I do too. Let us pray. Almighty God, our Father, words sometimes are so difficult to find, to express gratitudes and thanks. 
Every day of my life, I want to be thankful for what you've done for me. I am one of the richest people on the face of this earth. And I have been blessed far beyond measure. And I'm grateful for this family. And I'm grateful for this funeral home. And these people I've known for years and years. And they're always so nice to work with. We pray, our Father, that we would do everything that we could and can to enhance each other's lives and to be the kind of people that you would have all of us to be. And that when we make mistakes, as we surely will, that you would forgive us and help other people to forgive us too. Watch over and care for us. We ask in the name of Christ. Amen.